So we'll continue talking about uh, different types of functionalities we have in PyRosetta, uh, and we're going to move on with uh, using movers in our modeling of protein structures. So uh, this is a rather short lecture, and the whole goal is to um, talk about other ways of manipulating um, a protein of interest. And movers uh, do exactly what they sound like they do. Um, so the whole idea is to take a pose and make some minor modifications to it and do this to reach some type of design objective. So perhaps uh, you have protein that you're interested in binding. And then at the very interface, you might want to make minor perturbations to make sure you reach shape complementarity. So depending on exactly what question, what research question you're answering, movers give you a way of having these types of modifications applied onto your pose. And so you're going to use movers from the mover class. And most of the Rosetta protocols that we talk about are actually going to be movers. So they're just different types of movers. And you can have different protocols for different types of applications, different environment, um, just different biology. So you can sort of customize exactly how the mover regime is put together um, and change whatever settings to fit your specific problem. And you can also take a look at right here. So if you actually search for PyRosetta Movers or Rosetta Movers, um, you can get to this link and take a look at the list of different movers. Um, and we're going to do that before we go on with the lab anyway. But if you want to take a moment to do this right now, um, you're welcome to do that. And let's talk about an example. Um, so the way you would use it is, of course, you have to first identify what your pose is. You need some type of input for pose. And onto that pose, you apply some type of mover. So just like before, you can define your pose. Uh, you all know how to do this. And just like before, for during the score function lab, uh, you got to define which score function you're interested in using, and then you can identify sort of how many rounds of a mover you want to use, and then just apply that onto the pose that many times. And you, we're going to be exclusively using the Python style for movers, uh, but just so you know, if you wanted to have more freedom in terms of how Rosetta does things, you can also use XML objects in Python, and there are more movers than uh, can be seen in PyRosetta just from the get-go. But once again, PyRosetta is a nice, pretty package on top of all of Rosetta's source code. And if you really go deep into the source, you can make more alterations than you can at the PyRosetta surface. Um, but today, we'll just be demonstrating how you can use Mover's uh, Python style. And for example, this would be an XML object uh, that you can also just use. And you can sort of refer to this if during your project, you actually have to define a new protocol and write your own movers. And so we're just going to get started. So what I want to do is show you different categories of movers and talk through them a little bit. OK. So if you just look at Rosetta movers, um, you can read about their differences more specifically. Um, and this sort of introduces the most popular ones that people use. Um, and I want to talk about a few that you will see today. So let's just focus on shear and small mover. So these are under backbone movement. So what you're making are uh, sort of small changes, small perturbations to the backbone atoms. And then because we know what our protein or for one residue, so what it looks like, you have your backbone atoms. Um, can you sort of imagine what happens to, let's say, the side chain group once I make some perturbations 
and the backbone. Also, um, this residue, obviously for simplification, we just draw one here, but it's connected to a bunch of residues on either side, right? And so um, one thing that might be helpful is thinking about the effect of mover applied onto this residue of the pose on surrounding residues, as well as atoms that you didn't specifically modify. Just what happens, for example, to the overall energy, right? So this sidechain group is in a conformation that is best accommodated by my current backbone. I use small or shear mover and make some perturbations to the backbone. And let's say I keep the side chain exactly where it was. Can you see a problem with that? Okay. So you obviously don't break any covalent bonds. Um, you keep your carbon carbon distance. That's true. Um, so let's just maybe draw this. Let's just say this is the backbone. And then I'll just show you in some abstract form. Let's just say this is my side chain and it's pointing this way. And let's say that I make a perturbation to the phi and psi. And so remember those were planes. And if alpha carbon is sort of the center, you can imagine some type of perturbation in 3D. So you have to use your mind's eye a little bit, but you will see it during the lab. Um, and this is still connected to the alpha carbon, which is connected to the beta carbon, which is connected to the entire side chain. So you don't have to change anything about the side chain to make backbone perturbations. But as you change where that position's backbone is in relation to everything else, it changes the overall energetics of the pose. Maybe that changing things in this position has sound, some effects down the line around where you made that change, right? Let's say you're, ch you're taking an active site residue. So let's say that the side chain group actually binds zinc. And then you take that position and make some perturbations to either the backbone or the side chain. You can sort of imagine the neighbors having some type of energetics, uh, energetic payoff for whatever you changed. Um, and luckily, this is something we can investigate using the score function. Um, so with the score function, you can specifically get the energies uh, contributed by the side chain atoms versus the backbone atoms. So that's one way to really investigate what ends up changing and which one changes for the better or worse. As far as uh, we can calculate Rosetta energy, obviously, but it's a good place to start. Um, and then to distinguish between some of the uh, different movers that you're going to take a look at is uh, we have a shear mover and a small mover. So if we focus on just these two, the idea is to make uh, small changes to the torsion. So you only make small perturbations because we know from physics that you can have the lever effect. So once you make, if you make a very big fire psi change, it will sort of mess up the backbone down the line. So the magnitude of that change in terms of torsion space ends up causing a very big difference to the rest of the backbone. And so in order to have realistic movement, uh, people have built these types of movers where the idea is to only make small torsion moves. And in some cases, uh, just like in shear mover, you want to minimize any downstream effect. So once I make, once I take the ith residue and make some changes, I don't want I minus one and I plus one to start moving around so much to accommodate for whatever I changed. Um, and this is especially useful if for this residue alone, maybe you're interested in a point mutation, but you want to keep the rest the same. So there are some reasons you might want to keep uh, everything else exactly where it is. Another example is, well, maybe functionally speaking, every residue except for this and a few others are doing what they're supposed to do. 
They're exactly at the correct shape at the interface. And you just have a few residues that are sort of not what you wanted. Or maybe you're trying to uh, make some type of orthogonal protein. So you want to keep things similar enough, but different enough in certain areas. So this gives you control over exactly what should be changed while you get to minimize anything, any unwanted effects down the line. Um, and then let me quickly also go over back rub. So with back rub, for example, um, you can look more in detail, but you have a realistic backbone mover protocol in place where you can sort of get to make changes and add an element of uh, noise or some temperature to how much uh, of a perturbation you can have. And so you can change and tunes sort of how much uh, the movement is based on giving specific parameters to each of these mov movers. Um, and so even when you have a small mover, it's possible for you to have uh, basically zero minimization on down the line effects and move so far away from your starting point. You would just have to accept sort of very uh, drastically different torsion space. And of course, we have some criteria for what move should be used or could be used. Um, and if you wanted to accept or reject a move. Can you think of a reason you would want to reject a move? If you want to conserve like a particular domain of the protein, like say if you're looking at like the midline, you don't want to touch like not like the neck portion that's like trying to conserve across all different strains of influenza, that might be an area where you don't want any sort of mutations to occur or any sort of Okay, so maybe specifically you want conservation of residues in a region while still making some changes. And you want to have some very high constraint as to what can move in the region that you care to conserve. Um, and I think a good example of this uh, would also be antibodies. So if you wanted to use, or drugs in general, um, if you wanted to use some type of protein-based therapeutics and um, you sort of make a change that is recognizable by the immune system, you're going to raise an immunogenic response. And so the immune system is basically going to fight the protein instead of it being able to do whatever it was designed to do. Um, and so you might want to have high conservation regions that are recognizable by the immune system, for example. Uh, and so you wouldn't want movers or anything to be redesigned in those regions. Um, and there's many other cases where this is true. So uh, we're going to get to do a demonstration of these. And there should be at least one more mover where you can sort of experiment with it and see what's getting changed. Um, and we're going to get started with this slab, which is on the shorter side, so 